Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. Today I'm looking at Stalin and Khrushchev's political authority 1941 to 1964. Well, I'm going to look at part of it. In, in fact, this, this topic is going to be covered in three separate videos, which I'm going to be trying to, to get out in fairly quick succession. So what I'm going to look at today is part one, which is going to focus on the war years 41 to 45. Now, all of these are going to be really important, and there's a really good chance that if they were to ask about this in the exam, then they would put all three of these sections together. So they're all from section four of the spec, uh, and they're about uh, the Stalinist dictatorship and reaction, 41 to 64, uh, and we've got a political authority in war years uh, alongside um, the political, economic and social impacts of war. Uh, we've got political authority in government uh, to 53, high Stalinism, the revival of terror, destruction of the supposed opposition, and a cult of personality in the power vacuum at Stalin's death. And then we've got political authority in government, Khrushchev's rise to power, policies and ideology, destalinization, uh, political and party change. So again, a question, because we've got this bit where they have to cover at least 20 years, is likely to go something about change in continuity or degree of political authority, uh, something along those lines and cover the whole of the bit. There's just so much information. I'm going to to, to break it down into um, some separate videos, but they'll be, they'll be on my channel as a series. So first of all, we're going to have a look at the effect of the war on Stalin. Well, the, the beginning of this is quite well, uh, an unbelievable story, really. They're, uh, now, Stalin, a guy who was particularly in the time period we're looking at, renowned for his incredible paranoia and, and seeing enemies where there aren't enemies, um, kind of missed the biggest one, really. So there were intelligence reports saying the Germans are going to attack and he just ignored them. Even when reports came in about a massive German advance into the USSR, he didn't believe it. And, and there are accounts that suggest that the, the poor person who, who delivered to him the news, uh, who brought the news to him, was shot because he just saw this as, as, as someone trying to cause trouble. You wouldn't want to be the second person to go and confirm the, the, the message, would you? Um, in the first four, four weeks uh, of the conflict, 319 Red Army units were destroyed. Stalin just seemed completely despondent. He he fled from Moscow to his can, his country home, his Dhaka, uh, and, and he seemed to possibly suffer some sort of nervous breakdown, or or possibly he was just suffering from exhaustion because he was working so hard uh, to try and deal with this crisis he hadn't foreseen coming. Anyway, the members of the Politburo begged him to come back because essentially because of the way of the cult of personality and, and the fact that he wouldn't accept anybody else having any form of political power. Stalin had built a political system that was completely dependent on his leadership. Therefore, at this very crucial moment, if you take the leader out of that, then the whole thing starts to potentially crumble. So just over a, a week later, Stalin returned uh, to Moscow, um, much to the relief of uh, the rest of uh, the leadership. Now, now, during the war, he, he only made nine public speeches. Now, this might seem odd about this, this all-powerful leader of, a, of this large nation in, in the throes of the most horrendous war to only talk to the people nine times. But when he did speak, it, ha it had a big impact. Um, and, and a good example of this is one he made on the 3rd of July 1941, in which he started, Comrades, citizens, brothers and sisters, fighters of our army and fleet, I address you, my friends. Now, what's quite remarkable about that in its language, in its tone, and, 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 and the content in what he's saying is, is this is very un-Stalin like. He, he, he didn't ever called the Soviet people his friends or brothers and sisters. He hadn't, he hadn't done that, they certainly hadn't done that before. There, there's no focus on, on division and class enemies and, and that. It's, it's all about unity and everybody together. So he, he was emphasising the patriotic duty of everyone to fight off the invader. Uh, and he made another important speech with the Germans on the outskirts of Moscow later in 41. Uh, and when he made this speech, there were sounds of gunfire in the background. And this sent a very kind of strong symbolic message to the people that the, the government itself had been evacuated from Moscow, but Stalin insisted on remaining. So we've got in this a kind of, again, Stalin, slightly separate from government. Stalin is super strong and uh, is leading. Now, 
After the initial panic, which I just talked about, Stalin kind of established himself as a supreme military commander. However, it didn't look early on like he was very well suited to this. His initial strategy was a series of, of, of counterattacks against the Germans rather than an organised tactical withdrawal. He, the idea of withdrawal was kind, kind of country to his, his nature. And again, when you've got kind of Stalin's view on the disposability of people, then um, the counterattacks, even if they were going to bring heavy losses, which people told him they would, he still felt were worthwhile. And he thought he would be able to, to push the, the Nazis back. What he really should have done is withdrawn the Red Army to preserve his strength. So it is just all completely disastrous decisions. Uh, by the, by the, 40, the end of 41, the Red Army had lost an estimated 6 million men who had either been killed or captured. I mean, these numbers are just kind of mind blowing, but numbers with Russia often are. Even in the spring of 42, uh, Stalin ignored the advice of his generals and insisted on a series of counterattacks. Again, so they not worked in 41, unsurprisingly. Um, they didn't help. They didn't work in 42, which ultimately helped the Germans advance further into southern Russia, uh, Russia, and they ended up on the outskirts of Stalingrad, which is obviously enormously um, symbolic, particularly given its name. Um, and the battle for Stalingrad is is one of the most compelling and horrendous uh, of the Second World War. And I highly recommend out, outside of this, you go and do do a bit of research and look into the battle of Stalingrad and the. And if you maybe after exams, if you've got time, um, or, or if you have got time before, uh, uh, Anthony Beaver does a, a, an amazing book on Stalingrad and, and the details of everything that goes on in there. But th there is a, a crucial difference between Stalin uh, and Hitler in that, that Stalin makes mistakes early on and he learns from those mistakes. And so from the middle of 42 onwards, he, he began to listen to his generals more so once when hitler made mistakes he 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 blamed other people didn't didn't listen to, to the advice stalin kind of goes well actually i keep on doing this and it's not working so the most influential gen generals uh were uh Valizewski, uh who was chief of general staff uh, and zukov who was deputy supreme commander and zukov in particular is a, a hugely um important general uh, and th there, there are obviously going to be issues with him later on because if you rise up into great prominence uh, preeminence in, in, in Soviet Russia, you're seen as a potential rival to Stalin, and he doesn't deal with that very well. But they, they, these generals uh, come up with a successful counter attack at Stalingrad, um, and they, they managed to convince Stalin that their plans for forcing Germany out of the USA are, are better than his. Uh, and, and Stalin was recognizing the importance of promoting those with ability rather than just choosing people who were loyal. The, 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 the kind of the chips are really down. The, the, these issues need to be sorted. with. So just having surrounding himself with the yes men wasn't going to work. Now, <clears throat> we're going to continue looking at, at the effect then of the war on, on the government of the USSR. And in a way, it reinforces um, um, some elements. Uh, and there are some new bits that, that are added. So the key bit that's added is the, the Council for the State for State Defence, or uh, GKO. And this, in essence, really replaces the Central Committee, which hardly meets during the war, and takes away the authority of the Politburo. Now, this doesn't mean the people in the Politburo lose their authority, because a lot of them went into the JKO. And, and the JKO coordinates um, the war effort and, and, and takes over essentially control over both party and state. Stalin was chair, chairman of the JK, uh, GKO uh, uh, and he was also um, chairman of the Supreme Military Command. Now, these two positions uh, together meant that he was absolutely dominant. He was in a completely unchallengeable position in terms of political authority in the USSR. So if we're, if we're thinking about questions in this, during this period that in the war, there is this bit at the beginning where Stalin's authority looks like it might crumble as he seems to serve, kind of, serve some kind of exhaustion or nervous breakdown or something. But then as we get in, by, by the time we're talking kind of a bit later into 41, not much, not much later, it's a matter of months, uh, then, then actually we've got Stalin completely unchallengeable in terms of his position. Uh, other key figures um, remain important. So Beria, who, who remains head of the NKVD, and continued in the horrendously brutal method of um, ensuring loyalty that Beria specialised in. Uh, and there are some, some key examples of this. So 
Order 227 is a horrendously um, one in which established detachments of NKVD officers who would operate just behind the front lines and would shoot anyone who panicked or deserted or tried to run away. Uh, and so you've got this thing where you've got uh, and, uh, men pouring into Stalingrad for, it, for its defence who might be sharing a rifle between um, several people and told, don't worry about it, One, uh, just pick the rifle up when the other guy gets shot. But behind them is a series of people with machine guns. And so th those, th th the most effective killing was reserved for killing their own people if they didn't fight bravely and in the, going into the front line. And in the so in the Battle of Stalingrad, thirteen thousand Soviet troops were shot by their own side in just a few weeks. So as well as Order Two Two Seven, we've got Order uh, Order Two Seventy, and and this is that anyone who's running to the enemy was considered a traitor, now, and they faced the death penalty. So this generally meant for people they either faced death or death, which is not a great choice. So you either got so stick your hands up and surrender or I'll shoot you. But yeah, but if I stick my hands up and surrender, you might not shoot me. But if I ever get out, my own side will shoot me. Um, in, U in the Ukraine, the NKVD carried out a wave of reprisal, killing thousands of people who were accused of welcoming the German invaders. Propaganda also continues to play a key role. So that the whole cult of personality we talked about, which had been building up during the 1930s, was further promoted to boost people's confidence in Stalin as a great war leader uh, and a man who was kind of destined to lead them to victory. Uh, and patriotism was a, 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 fa a further kind of focus. And, and both of these raised morale because people believed that they, they were being led by the great Stalin. So everything would be OK, they, so they believed. And, and they, the, the idea of defending Mother Russia and, uh, and the greatness of, of Russian history and, and its people were, were really sent to, to boost the morale and make the Russian people uh, think that they, could, that they could continue and be victorious. At the end of the war, this all seemed to have paid off. Stalin was regarded as a, a, a great national kind of superhero. Propaganda and, and linked to the fact they had won uh, convinced the vast majority of the population that the, the earlier propaganda, they were told about Stalin being a genius. Well, it must be true. They'd, Stalin would win the war for us. The propaganda told us he would win the war for us, and he did. So it's not propaganda. It, it was true, so they believed. He was celebrated in poetry and song and posters and paintings and statues. Uh, it, however, he, him, Stalin himself didn't see this kind of this establishment of his authority. It, and it's difficult, really, to, to pit, put together a full picture, I think, of, of um, uh, Stalin's uh, mental state at this point. I mean, it, it, if you want to read things like The Court of the Great Tsar, uh, the, the Court of the Red Tsar, then um, that that's quite a, The uh, Court of the Red Tsar is a really good book, which will give you even more insight into stuff like this. But he, he seemed to get more and more paranoid during the war. He, he seemed that his suspicions of enemies of the USSR meant that he, and he believed that these enemies could be anywhere. Uh, and so he continued terror against perceived enemies. So although from a, a, a kind of, a, a kind of objective point of view, you go and go, well, what enemies? I mean, Stalin's position is completely secure. Nobody doubted his authority, particularly because of what had just happened in the war. But Stalin continued to see enemies everywhere. And the final uh, effect of the, the war on the Communist Party was, was it became a lot more aligned with mi the military. And this is then going to be really important as you go through into the Cold War. So during the, the war, the, the party expanded significantly uh, by uh, by 3.6 million. Two and a half million of those were also members of the armed forces. By 45, a quarter of the armed forces personnel were party members, making up about 50 percent of its total membership. Therefore, military dominance of the party going forward should probably not be a surprise. A historian, Martin uh, McCulley, has argued the necessity of war strengthened the bond between the party, uh, at the state and the military. And this is a significant long term factor. So what opposition was there during the war? Well, in terms of proper organised opposition, not really anything. Um, and this is going to be a huge disappointment um, to, to people like Hitler, um, but it, it is good news.
for the the, uh, the Communist Party in Soviet Russia. However, as we saw earlier with the, the NKVD's reprisals in the Ukraine, many Soviet citizens, because of the brutality of the, of the, the Soviet re regime and the way they'd been treated in the 1930s, welcomed the German armies in as le liberators rather than invaders. Um, and, and the particular groups who were likely to do this came from the national minorities in the west of the USSR, such as the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, as well as uh, places like Ukraine and Belarus, um, or Belarusa. So we, we've we got in this a, a, a kind of a whole set of, of collaborators. So it's not a kind of internal opposition, but it's people taking the side of um, the Germans and their allies as they invade. And we can break these into kind of three main categories. So there, there are the enthusiastic volunteers. Um, the, the, the kind of the biggest example of these are the Cossacks who provided uh, 250,000 troops for the Germans. Uh, another example is the Russian Liberation Movement, which was formed in, in the Ukraine uh, and had up to 50,000 men fighting alongside the Germans as part of the Waffen SS. So they, they again, absolutely we can see as an, as a, an important sign of, of disquiet and dislike of, of the Soviet regime. We also get the, the prisoners or deserters who join German forces. Now, in a way, you can almost see the, 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 the blame going back to the earlier order that we looked at. If you look at Order 270, well, if you have deserted uh, or you have been captured, then because of that order, if you go back into the, the hands of your own army, they're going to shoot you. And so the option of, of maybe then helping the German army it, it becomes one that they, some people turn to because the the the, the, um, the Russian troops are Slavs. They were considered by the Germans to be inferior to the Aryan soldiers, so they tended not to be given combat duties. And they were labelled those willing to help, and they were given jobs such as drivers, cooks, hospital attendants, and messengers. They weren't treated very well. Um, and then the other bit was um, Russian prisoners who were forced to carry out menial tasks to support the. Uh, the German army, such as uh, cleaning toilets and looking after the stables and things like that. Anybody who, from the Soviet point of view, was seen as having collaborated, it was given the harshest possible treatment, um, and and that's the, both during the war or afterwards. Uh, and the um, the Cossack population were were virtually wiped out uh, for their uh, their support of the German army. The um, the good news, really, in 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 terms of uh, impact of war, was on it, it is part of the economic bit. This is not that it made stuff in the economy good. It was more the the good news was that the the um, preparation of the 1930s uh, through the five year plan meant that the Russian economy was fairly geared up and ready for war. And the centralized command structure was well suited to the demands of war. The, the Soviet economy could be mobilized far quicker and more efficiently for war than, than the, the economy in Nazi Germany. Um, and, and the Russians had the foresight that this conflict would demand total mobilization of the nation's economic resources. And as we've seen earlier in the course, as we've been looking at the five year plans, the Soviet Union had very, very considerable economic resources. Now, they hadn't been utilized for things like consumer goods, but they had been um, massively improving in terms of raw materials and they had been improving in terms of military output. Um, now, we see one and a half million uh, where railway uh, wagon loads of industrial plant and machinery being moved from the western regions of the USSR to east of the Ural Mountains to keep them safe from the Nazi uh, invasion. This represented up to 10% of the USSR's uh, production capacity and, again, a, a very good strategic move, keeping it, it, it safe. Three and a half thousand new factories were created and thousand more existing manufacturing plants were converted to war production. Uh, and this included armaments, tanks, planes. So uh, the despite the loss of a huge amount of territory to the German army in 41 and 42, Soviet factories were producing more war material than German factories uh, in 1943. And from 43 onwards, that that level of production really starts to to have a big impact on, on the war itself. 
Mass production techniques were being improved continuously, as of the hours needed to produce the T-34 tank were, were more than halved in the duration of the war. Uh, these improvements also required uh, less manpower, uh, and that, that was important at a time when skilled labor was in great shortage. I mean, th there's some amazing stuff in terms of it, Soviet it, industry going on. I mean, there were, there's, again, stories of Stalingrad where there were there were actually gunfights. They were fighting inside one of the tank fa tank factories. They continued manufacturing tanks. The tanks rolled off the production line and straight out into the battle. Um, and the Soviet industry produced some of the most effective armaments of the war. Um, the the T thirty four tank eventually proved to be superior to the German Panzer tanks. Uh, uh, the Yak one fighter plane was also very highly regarded. And again, we talked before about the developments in, in, in Soviet Russia in terms of the development of scientific education and technology, and these stuff start to pay off. It is important to note that there were negative issues in terms of what was going on with Soviet industry as well. Uh, again, we still got this quantity of, of uh, quantity over quality. So there are key bits of military hardware that break down. Um, some of the Soviet uh, aircraft had absolutely appalling safety records, uh, records, and during the war, and um, various of this military equipment and notoriously was was very dangerous to use, in particular uh, the land mines, which were really unstable. You don't, and that's not something you want to be handling if it's unstable. So, continuing with um, economic impact, we we see first of all in agriculture. Um, the countryside was stripped of men, horses, and machinery, which all pushed over to the um, to the war effort. By the end of the war, 80% of collective farm workers were women. Um, carts were often being and ploughs were soon being pulled by people rather than uh, by machinery or or um, by livestock. Um, the, the the procuring of grain from the collective farms remained. Re Return to kind of really ruthful, ruthless extremes, and, and so malnutrition amongst the peasants was, was almost universal. It was, it was, it was the norm. Um, the only group who, of people who were going to get enough food were the the soldiers and essential manual labourers. <coughs> um, the peasants were allowed to keep their small private plots of land, many of which were expanded, and they could sell their produce at market. Um, but this wasn't sufficient uh, to provide them with a full diet. So this, the, the, the suffering of the Russian people essentially continues. One of the good bits of news for the Soviet economy, though maybe not ideologically, was the, the Lend-Lease scheme. So even before entering the war, the USA uh, was supplying uh, both Britain and the USSR with essential supplies to keep them going in the struggle against Nazi Germany. The scheme was called Lend-Lease. In theory, these supplies would be returned or paid for after the war is finished. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, once Germany invaded the USSR, Britain made a contribution to supplying more resources to, to them. Um, the most uh, important supplies that came in were uh, transport, such as trucks, jeeps, railway stock, as well as important things like tin food. Um, in, in one notable one being spam. Khrushchev famously remarked that without spam, we would not have been able to feed our army. Um, in 43 and 44, land lease made up about 10 percent of the Soviet's GDP and 94 percent of that, those supplies came from the USA. So it kept the, the Soviet Union going. I mean, one of the, the famous quotes from Stalin about um, the, the, the Second World War was that um, Britain uh, gave time in holding up um, the Nazi resources, that, that the USA gave money and the money is illustrated um, uh, by the Lend-Lease scheme uh, uh, and the Soviet Union gave blood. And when we look at some of the statistics, um, that quite clearly is true. So the cost of the war to the economy is is, is, is fairly mind blowing um, and quite depressing stuff. So uh, the devastation in the Western regions of the USSR is just unbelievable. Um, the Red Army destroyed as much of it as possible as it could using scorched earth policy, so the Germans couldn't use the valuable resources that were there. What well, anything the Germans could take, they did, um, as well as deporting millions of, uh, millions of um, workers to use in slave labour camps. Um, and so we see scorched earth, we see the Germans pillaging, we see then the Germans destroying whatever's left as they retreated. <coughs> 
So we see this whole area, the, the Soviet Union be stripped of men, animals, machinery, the transport uh, network would need completely rebuilding, public services and buildings had been completely obliterated. So here's some crazy statistics for you. So the USSR had lost 1,700 towns, 70,000 villages, 31,000 factories, 65,000 kilometers of railway track and 40% of its agricultural output. And we know from all the stuff that we've looked at so far, one of the things that Russia and then the Soviet Union has always struggled to do is feed its people. I mean, th th these num those numbers are just, um, um, well, mind blowing. Very, very, very hard to contemplate the human suffering that they would bring. Now, the next bit I'm going to look at is, is social effects of the war, uh, and this this has got kind of many many parts to it. Um, so you, Stalin saw the war to start off with as, a, as an opportunity to expand Soviet control over territory, but also to, to strengthen its control over, over national minorities. Now, even before the war started, the Nazi-Soviet pact had, had given the USSR control of the eastern half of Poland. Following this, one and a half million Poles were de deported to villages and labor camps in Kazakhstan and Siberia. And in one of the, the most horrendous events uh, of, uh, of um, Soviet history at this point, in April um, 1940, we see um, 20,000 Polish army officers and members of the Polish elite being shot and buried in mass pits in the, in the for us uh, of Katyn. Now, Stalin, I, Stalin was determined there would be no resistance to the Soviet control of Poland, uh, uh, and this was this was the method he he used again a, 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 a horrendous crime against humanity. This one. Now, the control of uh, of Eastern Poland would last for less than two years because it would be taken by the German army in 41. However, this brutal treatment of uh, anyone that Stalin thought might prove resistance uh, and and the, the fate of other national minorities are kind of highlighted by, by the horror uh, of these events in 1940. So there are lots of other examples of deportations and repression of national minorities. So the 600,000 Volga Germans were deported to Eastern Siberia, uh, even though there was no reason to suspect their loyalty to the USSR. Um, many had sons and brothers fighting in the Red Army. Uh, we see the mass arrest and ex execution of Ukrainians in 43 and 44 as the Red Army pushed west. Um, Stalin was angry at the reports that some Ukrainians welcomed the German advance in occupation in 41. However, the the, the reprisals don't didn't meet were massively excessive. They, they, the some Ukrainians had welcomed the German advance. Um, Stalin read some as all, essentially, in in the way that he then treated the Ukrainians in, in 43 and 44. Two million people from the Caucasus region, including Chechens, Crimeans, Tatars, uh, and and Kamiks, were deported to Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, and Siberia. Uh, and Stalin had never trusted the loyalties of these nationalities, and this again meant that during the war he felt he needed um, to to carry out these horrendous deportations. In '44, when Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were re-annexed by the Red Army, thousands of members of their elites were arrested and sent to the gulags or shot. Um, and, and Stalin was determined that he was going to put new leaders in place that would be completely loyal to him because of the actions in those countries. He believed that they'd shown disloyalty and uh, and and gone over to the Nazis. Now the deportation numbers are terrifying. When you add on on to that the fact that a about a quarter of those who were transported died, died in transit uh, or within five five years in the special settlement or labor camps. So the, again, the extent of human suffering is, is unbelievable. And this, is, this is, again, is a terrible crime against humanity that was carried out by Stalin's regime. Now, we also see uh, about five million Soviet citizens stranded in German occupied Europe. Some of them are prisoners of war. Others are being deported by the Germans to work in slave labor camps. Um, some were Red Army deserters who'd end up fighting against the Red Army. 
Now, whilst that latter group you would logically be regarded as traitors, remember back to Order 270, Stalin considered everyone who spent time under German occupation as being under suspicion. Now, three million people were sentenced to time in labour camps, even though many of them had suffered terribly in the German slave labour camps already. So if you can imagine being freed from a German slave labour camp by your own army, only to be rearrested and sent to a slave labour camp in your own country, because the fact that you were in a slave labour camp meant that they were suspicious of you. When and or if any of these people were finally released, they, they, they had the words socially dangerous put on their records uh, and they had to live with the ongoing stigma of this for more years. So rather than eliciting great sympathy uh, 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 and uh, and support for what they'd suffered, they, these people were permanently labelled as potential enemies of the state. Only 20% of those returning from German occupied Europe were allowed to return home immediately. The vast majority of these were older men, women and children. The impact of the war on, on, on women was very, very notable. So one million women actually served in the armed forces. And, and so Soviet attitude to women on the front lines and actively serving was, was different um, uh, to those in other armies at, at, at this point in time. So this includes over a thousand female snipers who killed an estimated 12,000 German soldiers. Um, the so-called night witches uh, who flew uh, almost 24,000 bombing raids in flimsy uh, biplanes, uh, of whom 23 received the hero of the Soviet Union award. Um, there were female radio operators and signalers who served with the frontline troops and suffered heavy casualties. Of the nurses and doctors, um, there was a huge number of women. 40% of doctors were female and they would uh, they would treat the, the, the war wounded, uh, often at very great personal risk right next to the front line. Uh, the proportion of women working in industry increased from 41% uh, to 53% after 42. Uh, the, the rise was particularly significant in lighter industries when, where women made up 90% of the workforce. On collective farms, we've already said, um, the female workers increasingly took over and 80% and of, of the collective workers were female and a lot of the land, this land work had to be done by hand because the machinery and the animals had been taken elsewhere. In general, what we, we, we see with the Soviet people is almost the horrors of, of the Soviet regime of the 20s and 30s who prepared them um, for war. So they were used to, to bravely facing and enduring hardship. And so we see this, we see, for example, uh, Leningrad being under siege. It lasted for 900 days. Um, the daily ration was reduced to 125 grams of bread and that contained um, uh, sawdust to, to make it spread to even get it to 125 grams. The German people were used, used to living in these horrendously harsh conditions. And they 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 endured. Uh, on average, the, across the USSR, living standards fell by about 40 percent. Um, but the horrors of the Nazi occupation uh, and it provoked a mass determination, determination to resist the invader at all costs amongst the Soviet people. Um, and again, you might have seen stuff on on how horrendously the Nazi occupiers treated the Soviet people who who they considered um, to be inferior. And so they were willing to work, the Soviet people were willing to work for their government to fight the Nazi invaders off, no matter how badly they had previously been treated by the Soviets themselves. Um, all undrafted men aged 16 to 55 were required to register for, for war work and likewise for women between 16 and 45. Um, pensioners were encouraged to return to work if they were physically capable. Uh, over time, um, we we see that becoming compulsory. We see all holidays being suspended, working days extended to 12 hours. Uh, the average working week became over 70 hours. Uh, many workers simply slept in the factory. Uh, Labour discipline, which had been really harsh during five year plans anyway, was tightened even further. Uh, and even something as seemingly minor as unauthorised absence was punishable by death. Um, again, we're seeing absolute extremes as we tend to under Stalin. The statistics of how the, the war affected the Soviet people then, again, some of this stuff is just 
the scale is just unbelievable. And you have to remember that under these big numbers, that there was an enormous amount of human suffering. So the USSR lost 27 million people during the war. About a third of these were military personnel, so the other two thirds are civilians. Um, the figure is over 80 times higher than the losses suffered by either Britain or America. About a quarter of these deaths, we estimate, were caused by starvation. 70% of the dead were younger men, meaning that in 46, there were 96 million women compared to only 74 million men. 80 million people, 40% of the population, had lived under German occupation. Uh, 25 million people had been moved from their homes. 29 million had served in the armed forces. So just some mind blowing numbers for you then. But again, useful things um, for any assessment or essays. So in terms of, um, of propaganda and culture, well, the propaganda focused on um, relentless kind of nationalistic and patriotic themes. Um, in the Soviet Union, uh, the war is referred to as the Great Patriotic War. Um, and, and people were willing to sacrifice themselves for Mother Russia. Uh, Non-Russian nationalists were encouraged to fight uh, with their Russian uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, and the, the, the anti-German content of propaganda was rather kind of um, extreme, um, as you would expect. Um, they, in the cultural sphere, there was greater freedom of expression than there had been um, in, in the previous bit of the 1930s. But there was freedom of expression as long as it culturally supported the war effort, didn't criticize the Soviet state. So there were some writers and artists who had previously been banned or remained silent who were reconciled to the regime. So we, we've got the people um, like Anna Akamatova, who um, had not been had not worked in the 30s, but was now broadcasting poetry on radio. And uh, she played uh, an important role during the long siege of Leningrad in keeping morale high. Uh, we we see composers who fall out of favour also being um, uh, reprieved and, and composing. There's a, a famous symphony, Leningrad, which was performed for the first time at the height of the siege in 42. And the performance was broadcast across the city on loudspeakers. In terms of religion, the persecution that we've seen earlier in Soviet rule was eased. The restrictions on the Orthodox Church uh, and on bishops and priests were, were eased. The many bishops and priests were released from the labor camps. And as long as they swore an oath of allegiance to the Soviet state, they were they were allowed to to deliver sermons, etc. Those sermons were required to have um, a patriotic uh, undertones and motivate the people in the war effort. So thank you very much uh, for watching. I hope that's uh, proved to be uh, useful to you. Please uh, do like and um, and if you haven't done so, uh, subscribe. Uh, and I will be uh, adding to this this playlist and in particular the on the, the theme of political authority, which it, which is a really important one. There's a, a couple more videos coming that will look, then look at high Stalinism after the war, and then Khrushchev following that to kind of give a an overarching um, theme on that one. Um, thank you very much for watching.